Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough, and we're exploring the wonderful region of the Cotswolds in southwest England. For the last couple of years, we've been following in the footsteps of Herbert Evans, who wrote this wonderful book, Highways and Byways in Oxford and the Cotswolds, in 1905. Today you find Ross, Widget, Gizmo and me in a little hidden village called Sapperton. It's a beautiful spring day. The sun is shining. We're really looking forward to going around this little village. It has a fabulous church about which Evans writes in some detail. And I will read to you what he has to say shortly. But this is also the western end of the Great Canal that burrowed under the hills here to join the Severn and the Thames. And we're going to see if we can find the entrance to that canal. Come with me, we're going to show you around. The church claims our first attention. Though, with the exception of the tower, it dates only from the early 18th century, it is a building of exceptional interest. To enter is to be transported in a twinkling back to the days of good Queen Anne. Instinctively, you look around for the rector in gown and bands, the musicians with bass viol and oat boy in the gallery, and Sir Robert in laced coat and flowing periwig, seated at his ease in the squire's pew. Sir Robert, do I say? The Gloucestershire man, versed in the history of the Atkins family, will of course remind me that there were two Sir Roberts, father and son, and that as the son survived the father only a couple of years, the chances are that they've frequented the family pew together. And well they may, for the father resided at the manor house quite close to the church, the son at Pinbury, only a mile higher up the valley. The Atkinsons were a family of lawyers, and for generations there had always been a judge in the family. Sir Robert, the elder, was Lord Chief Baron of the Exchequer, and purchased Sapperton at the Restoration from the Pools, who had held it since the time of Henry the Seventh. His son, the younger Sir Robert, represented Cirencester in the Oxford Parliament of 1681, and was the author of the ancient and present state of Gloucestershire, to which we have referred more than once. He died in 1711, the year before his book was published, and is buried in the south transept of the church. There you may behold him in effigy, reclining in a dignified manner on his elbow. He left behind him, says his epitaph, Louise, Lady Atkins, daughter of Sir George Carteret of Horns in Bedfordshire, his most dear and sorrowful widow who erected this monument to his memory, though he left behind him one more durable, the ancient and present state of Gloucestershire. Another monument presents the figure of a youthful knight, the eldest son of Sir Henry Poole. The church abounds in Jacobean carving which was removed from the manor house before it was pulled down in 1730 by Lord Bathurst, to whom Sapperton was sold by the heirs of the last Sir Robert Atkins. All this carved oak gives the church quite a character of its own and harmonises excellently with the style of architecture. At the same time, there is no mistaking its origin. The massive communion table, for example, has a lower shelf irresistibly suggestive of a sideboard, while the classic termini which ornament the bench ends and the front of the gallery were plainly designed for a very different scene. But the whole effect is fraught with a peculiar charm 
which is further enhanced by the strongly built wagon roof of the nave and the exquisite pale green transparent glass of the windows, which has only in one instance been displaced to make room for the vulgar abomination known as cathedral glass. The churchyard contains the base and shaft of a 15th century cross, another of those many crosses we have found all over the Cotswolds, which mark a stopping point during the pilgrimages in medieval times. It also contains a number of 18th century carved chest tombs and headstones, and planar tombs of the 18th and 19th centuries, with copper inscription plates, including some signed by Cook of Stroud, Ursel of Sarancester, Isles of Minchinhampton, and Freebury of Stroud. The churchyard was closed for burials in the 1940s. St. Kenelm, to whom this church is dedicated, and who has seven other churches in England bearing his name, was the Boy King of Mercia. Some of you may remember when we visited Winchcombe, we told the story of how in 819, when he was but seven years old and succeeded to the throne, his older sister, Quendria, supposedly wanting the throne for herself, is said to have persuaded Kenelm's guardian, Ascobert, with hints that he might share the throne with her, to take the boy into the forest, murder him, and bury him in an unmarked grave. This, Ascobert supposedly did, enabling Quendrira to observe brightly that her little brother seemed to have disappeared. The plotters, however, were soon undone. Miraculously, a dove flew to Rome, bearing a scroll telling the Pope where Kenelm's body could be found. After a long delay whilst a translator was found to decipher the scroll, there weren't many English speakers in Rome in those days, the Pope apparently responded, and Kenelm's faithful subjects recovered the body and bore it home to Winchcombe Abbey. On the journey, wherever the body was set down, a clear spring of healing water materialised, a prelude to many other miracles. As for Quendrira, her eyes fell out onto her psalter while she was reciting a curse against her little brother as he was carried through the streets of Winchcombe, and she died soon afterwards. Although, actually, she didn't. I don't mean to be a spoil sport, but the hard fact is that about the very time she is represented as suffering condign punishment for her misdeeds, Gwenthrith, as she herself spelled her name, was actually making atonement to Wulfrid, Archbishop of Canterbury, for the wrongs her father, King Kenelf, had done to him. At a council held in 825, she handed over to the sea certain lands in lieu of others which Kenelf had forcibly wrested from the Archbishop. A modern window in my old school church at Harrow depicts her in the act of reverently handing over the title deeds. Evans tells us that she subsequently held the position of abbess in more than one convent, and presumably, therefore, ended her days in the odour of sanctity. Such is the vulnerability of reputations. Evans also tells us about the canal tunnel that starts just below the village. On this beautiful but wet underfoot spring day, I ruthlessly sent Ross to explore the steep and slippery lanes to find the canal. He tells me he succeeded, so hopefully you're looking at images of it now. The tunnel is still derelict, but there is serious effort afoot to restore it soon. This is what Evans wrote in 1905. From the churchyard, which commands a lovely view down the valley, we descend to Daneway. On our way, we pass the mouth of the tunnel, 
that carries the Thames and Severn Canal through the watershed, which separates the basins of the two rivers. The tunnel is nearly two miles and a half in length. The whole length of the canal from Stroud to Letchlade, where it joins the Thames, being over 30 miles. It was opened in 1792 and was then looked upon as a colossal undertaking and a tremendous triumph of engineering skill. The idea had been ventilated in the reign of Charles II and it had afterwards been one of Lord Bathurst's visionary schemes. No one can visit Sarancester without becoming familiar with this enthusiastic and hospitable lord, the creator of its famous park and the intimate friend and correspondent of the Pope. I hope you've enjoyed our little spin around Sapperton. This has been a real eye-opener for us. We, didn't, we weren't kind of expecting the extraordinary idyllic beauty of this place. And of course the addition of the canal at the bottom of the valley, the remarkable church with its carving and its remarkable monuments. It's been enormous fun. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You can find us on all the normal platforms, of course. Have a look at our website, thecotswoldexplorer.co.uk, where you can find details of all we've done in the past. And we look forward to seeing you again in the very near future, somewhere else in the Cotswolds.